Hello, everyone. It is six o'clock, but I'm going to give just a couple more minutes um, for people to log in. It's always fun to navigate those those online links, online team links. Um, if you haven't done so already, we'd love to hear um, where you're from or if there's a particular lake of interest that brought you to the webinar tonight or if you just want to say hi. Um, We'd love to hear from any of you guys in the chat. We got more and more people trickling in. Wonderful. I'm so glad you guys could all join us, even though it's like the first nice weather night we've had in, well, a, a month almost. Thank you guys for spending your evening with us. All right, I'm going to go ahead and kick things off and um, more people will likely trickle in here. So welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight at our lake webinar. I am Madeline Sevlin and I'm with the Carver County Water Management Organization. And our organization manages lakes and rivers for about 90% of Carver County. There are um, pieces of Chaska and Carver, Chanhassen and Victoria that are actually outside our boundaries and are managed by other water management organizations. So while we manage and monitor most of the lakes in Carver County, it's not quite all of them. Um, and tonight we are talking all about lakes. We have Joe Bischoff with Bar Engineering here, and he's going to help us better understand the intricate and connected nature of lakes. But before Joe gets his talk going, uh, I have a couple colleagues, Tim Sunby and Angie Edgecombe, who are also with Carver County Water Management Organization. And they'll be giving uh, a couple quick updates on the Lake Bavaria management plan and the water quality within Lake Bavaria. And this is because the, the webinar really kind of grew out of this, um, the communications activities that were identified for the Lake Bavaria management plan. So we'll kick off with those two. And as you may have guessed, probably attending prior webinars, we will be using the chat feature for questions. So if you have any questions during any of our presenters, um, talks, please go ahead and type it into our chat. And then one of my other colleagues, Drew, will be keeping track of questions and asking them of our pre presenters at the end of their talks. So we will get started. Um, I'd like to introduce Tim Sunby, who is a water quality analyst with the Carver County Water Management Organization. Evening, everyone. This is Tim Sunby, and I want to say thanks again for everybody showing up. It's always uh, difficult to give up a nice evening like this, especially after waiting for, seems like seven months. Um, I'm just gonna kind of run through our uh, goals and kind of the future steps here for our management plan. We are currently, our goal is to pull together a, a management plan for Lake Bavaria just to kind of guide actions and goals that everybody around the lake and other stakeholders, the city or township um, can grasp and, and help meet our goal of preserving Lake Bavaria. So what is a lake management plan? It's, it's a living document that manages the beneficial uses of a lake. Um, it's, it's one that where we might write uh, the document right now, but two, three years down the road, we might notice something has changed or not changed, and we can go back and update this document so we can keep improving it and keep uh, improving and preserving the lake. It helps us understand the impacts of human uses. We're not uh, stating that anything done around the lake is 
is bad and, and must stop now. We understand that, you know, we're going to use the lake. We're going to, we want to be on the lake and recreating on the lake in and around. We live on the lake and anything we do is always going to have an impact to the lake. And what this plan does, it just plans ways to mitigate how we recreate and use a lake. Um, with, with use, there's always going to be an impact, and we, we just need to find ways to kind of mitigate that just to make sure that we pass this lake down to future generations in the same um, state or even a little bit better so they can enjoy it as well. So in the plan, there are three main areas. Uh, I, we kind of I broke them out here. The first one is we gather all the information about the lake, um, and then we identify concerns and set those priorities. And finally, uh, this is the main reason why we have this plan. It develops the goals, objectives, and actions that people can do to help uh, improve the lake or protect the lake. For gathering information, this is uh, information on the physical characteristics, chemical and biological characteristics of the lake and, and watershed. Anywhere that a, a raindrop falls that goes to Lake Bavaria, we want to understand how it gets there, why it's the condition it is once it gets into the lake. Um, so we're looking at the watershed boundary, uh, waterways. So these are storm pipes, creeks, uh, ditches, anything like that, soils and slopes, uh, the bathymetry of the lake. That's basically the contours, how deep, if there's any structures underneath the water. Um, fish surveys, it tells you what, what's the makeup of the of the fish community and then also the aquatic vegetation which plays a huge role in um, how a lake responds to various uh, inputs and and different activities that happen and we also have been actively monitoring chemical data um, and this is kind of what we do on our boat um, since 1999 we go out we take uh, transparency readings we just want to see how far down you can see uh, we take water samples to see phosphorus and chlorophyll a which is kind of a, a stand-in for how um, productive a lake is or another way to think about how green the lake gets during the year and then also nitrogen how much nitrogen is in the lake um, last year we started um, intensively monitoring lake inlets uh, we want to know what the loads are coming in to the lake and from what area. So we're going to continue doing that collection this year uh, and then into the near future as well to build out our understanding of what's going on in the watershed. The next one is identifying concerns and set priorities. Um, you know, we need to accurately identify the concerns and problems it, this way. Um, it motivates everybody involved if it's clearly defined what we need to do. Um, we've already sent out surveys to landowners. Um, these will help us assess and prioritize these concerns. And then finally develop that mission statement. What are we really trying to do for Lake Bavaria? And then finally, like I said, we want to develop those goals, objectives, and actions. Goals are that those general statements, the long-term vision of the lake and the objectives are those near-term goals that are specific and measurable. And then finally, those actions are the specific steps to take to accomplish the objectives. Um, and these are realistic and also results orientated. So those last two objectives and actions, we can measure those and we can tell if we are meeting the goals or, or getting closer to our goals as we go along. Lastly, kind of wanted to go through our timeline and next steps. Um, we've already gathered a lot of data. We have a lot of the physical characteristics, the watershed, the soils, uh, bathymetry. We've done fish surveys out there, both um, within our, our office and then also the DNR have done fish surveys and then aquatic vegetation surveys we've completed in the last couple of years out there. So that's really helped us understand what's going on out there. Um, we're going to continue monitoring uh, both the lake and the inlets for this year, and we're going to use that data to really understand how phosphorus moves through this whole system. Um, kind of looking at the fall and winter, we're going to be reaching out to some stakeholders to further define our concerns and priorities of this lake. Um, and then finally, next year, uh, kind of that last third step is to set goals, get our objectives down, and actions. Um, to be completed around the lake. Uh, and I think 
by the end of next year, we should have this uh, management plan down and, and starting to kind of protect uh, Lake Berberia. So if we have any questions, I am open. Just one question so far, Tim. Uh, the DNR lists mercury in fish from the lake as a concern. Any idea what the measurements or risk levels are? I do not know what the levels are. I know for risks, usually the DNR sets out, um, they will have guidelines of the number of fish you can eat during a week and a month, uh, depending if you're an adult or a child, pregnant or not pregnant. Um, that should all be on the DNR website. And I believe if you just go through DNR Lake Finder, uh, you can type in Bavaria Lake and you have all the information that DNR has on that lake uh, right at your fingertips, whether it's um, some water quality or lake levels and uh, fish consumption is also in there. Thanks, Tim. We got one more just rolling in. Uh, are wake boats a concern for erosion or other environmental characteristics? Wake boats are definitely uh, a topic of, of um, discussion, especially around the state and even in the le state legislature right now. Um, they do, ev even boats or pontoons do uh, have a concern for erosion, especially during high waters. Um, if they're too close to the shore, those wave action and that energy of the waves will erode away uh, shorelines. Um, the, with wake boats, they do have a, the characteristics of sitting pretty low in the water to create a large wave. So, you know, operating one of those, you should be farther away from the shore. Um, and then, you know, if you get too close in the shallow waters, they do have potential impacts to aquatic vegetation as well. Those are currently all the questions I have. Thanks, Tim and Drew. Um, Tim, perhaps we can find the U of M did a study on wakes and boat wakes. Perhaps we can find a link and post that into the chat for our attendees. I'll see if I can dig it up. Um, but right now we will move on to our next short little presentation by Andy Edgecombe, who is our lead water resources technician with Carver County. So Andy, we'll pass it off to you. Thanks, Madeline. Um, like she said, now I'm going to discuss uh, lake, the current lake, uh, Lake Bavaria water quality and how a lake becomes impaired. So to give you a quick overview, like Tim mentioned, we uh, monitor total phosphorus within Lake Bavaria. Uh, it's generally considered the limiting nutrient in lakes to uh, for algae and uh, more algae, more total phosphorus in the system. The, the more algae within the system. Uh, so the 2021 average concentration for total phosphorus was 30 uh, micrograms per liter uh, versus the state standard of 40 micrograms per liter. So it's well below the state standard. Um, however, this we haven't been observing this um, uh, over the past few years. We kind of saw a bright spot in 20 in 2021 due to the uh, the dry year last year. However, we have been seeing over the um, the history of when we started sampling Lake Bavaria, we we are seeing a phosphorus increase in Lake Bavaria. Uh, recently, just as last year, we were very close to the state standard. Uh, 2018, we were above. 2016, we were above, and then 2013, we were above as well. Those are some recent years that we were above the state standard for total phosphorus, which is the red line here. Uh, moving on to chlorophyll A. Uh, this is the primary pigment for photosynthesis in plants and algae. We take the sample in open water, so this generally tells us how much algae is within within the water sample and within the lake. Uh, for Lake Bavaria in 2021, we saw 15 micrograms per liter, which is one microgram above the state standard at 14. Uh, again, uh, this is kind of a bright spot. We have been getting some very high readings uh, for chlorophyll A on Lake Bavaria, um, a huge spike uh, for Lake Bavaria in 2018. Um, 
and it, it, we have to go back to 2009 to get a value that's or yeah we have to go back to 2009 uh, to get a value below the state standard for chlorophyll a similar to total phosphorus uh, it is trending upward for 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 chlorophyll a uh, transparency uh, that's how clear the water is uh, that's measured using a secchi disc. Uh, the 2021 20, average transparency was 1.9 meters. Uh, this is kind of opposite from the other two variables that I discussed uh, earlier. Uh, you want to have a larger value for transparency, so that exceeded the state standard of 1.4 meters. So that that is a that is a good thing. We have clear water, and again, similar to the other the other variables, uh, that's kind of a bright spot for 2021. 20, uh, um, if you see here, uh, the y-axis is in reverse order, so we can see that the water transparency is decreasing in, in Lake Bavaria from when we began sampling. Um, similar to those other years, 2018, 2016, 2013, uh, 2012, those were all above the state standard in 2015 as well. Uh, quickly here, how I uh, just want to describe how a lake becomes impaired. Um, Bavaria is very close to that. Um, so the state takes into account the 10 year summer averages for total phosphorus, chlorophyll A and transparency, and then they compare them to the state standard. If total phosphorus in either either chlorophyll A or transparency exceeds the state standard, the lake is considered impaired. So to quickly run through these here. Uh, the 2012 to 2021 summer average for total phosphorus was 37 micrograms per liter, uh, three micrograms per liter below the state standard. So that is good. Green is good. If we look at chlorophyll A, uh, the 2012 to 2021 summer average was 22 micrograms per liter. Uh, that's above the state standard. If we look back to the uh, previous 10-year uh, period, uh, we see that it was below the state standard, so that's increased uh, above the state standard uh, in this in this 10-year stretch. Uh, the 10-year transparency um, average, we see that 2012 to 2021 summer average was 1.38 meters, which is uh, which is below the state standard. So if we look at that uh, that statement again, if total phosphorus in either chlorophyll A or transparency exceeds the state standard, the lake is considered impaired. So we have total phosphorus is good. That is the only reason that we are not, Lake Bavaria is not currently impaired. And only three micrograms per liter uh, is in between uh, um, Lake Bavaria becoming impaired as well. So it's, it's, it's very close. It's very close because um, chlorophyll A and transparency are both considered impaired. Uh, just to give some examples on some comparisons, if you recreate on other lakes, uh, some other uh, impaired lakes around Carver and County include, they're all listed here in red. These are all uh, nutrient impaired, uh, impaired for nutrients, um, but some some close to Bavaria and are similar in, in uh, size and depth, uh, Wasserman, Parley, Virginia, Reeds, Hides, and Auburn. And that's all I have for you tonight. All right, thanks, Andy. I do have a couple more questions coming in for Tim and Andy. Uh, let's see. Uh, people have moved into these lakes and removed a lot of the natural vegetation. Can that be uh, re-added uh, to protect the shore from uh, erosion issues? Usually, usually it'll grow back, but there has been some studies where they uh, implant plants uh, back to the lake. Usually the water quality has to be uh, kind of noticeably better, but there has been some studies where uh, folks have um, implant or replanted uh, aquatic plants in, in, in the littoral zone. All right, and just a reminder for everyone, uh, Tim has posted a link to a University of Minnesota study uh, they have conducted recently on uh, waves from recreational boats and um, how they may have an effect on shorelines. 
Um, another question coming in are what fish species are indicators that a lake is impaired? So um, the DNR does uh, IBI surveys. Um, that's in, uh, they do a special type of survey and then they, it's kind of complicated to explain, but um, they punch, they, they take the survey results into, uh, into, into, uh, into a spreadsheet and then they calculate this IBI or biological integrity or fish biological uh, index and uh, they compare that to state standards. It's not really if a fish is present that it's impaired. It's 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 based on the fish community and, and not just a single species of fish. Okay. Um, let's see. It looks like Dave B is wondering uh, the Lake Finder info from DNR is unusually brief for Bavaria and is wondering if there may be a link to a more complete report. Not sure if that's something we have currently, but if we find something, Dave, I'm sure we could send that to, to the group or to you. Um, and then I think this is the last question that has come in. Is the golf course a culprit in the rising phosphorus values? We're we are look we're currently looking at that in our in our inlet study. Um, However, it's it's not the only culprit. Um, it's kind of a whole the whole the whole watershed is influencing Lake Bavaria. It's not it's not just the golf course, but we are looking into that into our in in our inlet study. That is currently all the questions in the chat. All right, thank you, Drew and Andy. These are some really good questions, and actually, I think um, our next presenter is probably going to be able to help answer some of these as well. So with that, <clears throat> I would like to introduce our featured presenter for the night, Joe Bischoff. Joe is a senior aquatic ecologist and certified lake manager with Bar Engineering. His practices focus on shallow lake management with research in nutrient cycling and sediment chemistry, and his lake management experience includes fisheries, aquatic plants, and recreation. Joe has worked with several lake associations to help balance recreational uses of lakes with water quality and aquatic plants. And this work has led to numerous shallow lakes being removed from the impaired waters list. Joe and a client recently won a Lake Management Success Award from the North American Lake Management Society for their work restoring um, one of our own metro lakes, Bald Eagle Lake, which is near the city of White Bear Lake. So with that, I would like to introduce Joe. Joe, take it away. Great. Thanks for having me. Thanks everybody for coming out. Can you see my presentation and hear me okay? Yes, you are all set. Great. Great. Well, so we get to talk about one of my favorite topics, lake ecology and management. Um, spent almost, well, it's going on 25 to 30 years of working on lakes. Um, and so you kind of see a little bit of everything and run across a little bit of everything. So I'm going to give you kind of a high level overview of what we see, uh, what people expect for the lake and what we can actually do in terms of management, what tools we have, and then where we're going in terms of um, better understanding uh, our lake systems. So let's see here. All right, so here's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna talk about how lakes work to start, give you a little bit of a primer on lake ecology. I'm gonna take a whole college semester of limnology and I'm gonna cram it into about 20 minutes. Um, so I just want to give you a background on what the potential outcomes are, what we have to look at as a lake manager, and what are our options. And then we'll talk about setting targets. What can we actually uh, achieve in terms of enhancing our lake uh, for better use, whether that use is recreational use or whether it's better wildlife habitat, better water quality, better fishing, whatever that might be. But making sure that we're setting reasonable expectations for the lake. Um, I can't turn a lake into something it's not. Um, and then we'll talk about lake management. What does it take to enhance the lake? Um, thinking about these practical outcomes and then maximizing the beneficial use when we get into there. Uh, I've never seen a lake where you can do your restoration approach and then walk away. They all take active management, especially when they're highly used. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit. So let's talk about how lakes work. 
when I talk to most Minnesotans, this is what they think about um, in terms of what a Minnesota lake looks like. They either think of the boundary waters where we have these beautiful forested watersheds, clear water, lots of walleye, um, those types of things. Or they think about highly recreational lakes where we have our docks, we're able, the water's deep, we're able to boat, water ski, fish, do lots of different activities. So this is what the typical desired lake type is when somebody buys a lake home or thinks about uh, recreating or using or enjoying a lake in Minnesota. But the reality is we see lots of diverse lake conditions in Minnesota. And so these are some of the types of things that you might see where you see lots of aquatic vegetation, uh, floating leaf, uh, water lilies, you have submerged vegetation, vegetation very near to the surface. You get algal blooms that can look like um, the harmful algal bloom here uh, with the striped. If you can see my cursor um, or it can be filamentous algae that floats at the surface. Uh, there's lots of different conditions that we run across and a lot of these are unhealthy conditions. Some of them are actually healthy conditions for these lakes and we'll talk about that a little bit. So to understand how our lake works, we got to start with understanding what our lake zones are. So this is just a cross section of a typical lake where you have a terrestrial or that's your upland shoreland area and it goes into the shallower water and that's called the littoral zone. You'll hear me use that term. And it's really just the, the part of the lake where light penetrates deep enough into the water column to support uh, vegetation. And um, you, in the shallower areas, you'll get emergent vegetation, meaning it's growing up out of the water. Then you'll get into a zone that's the floating leaves um, where you have like water lilies and some of that. And then you have a submerged plant zone. And then when the lake gets deep enough that all the lake, the, the light that hits the, the lake kind of gets dispersed and can't reach the bottom anymore, that's called our open water zone or our limnetic zone, we'll call it. And so here you don't have any aquatic plants uh, growing into it. It's too deep for that. And then you have interactions um, with the sediment in those deeper areas, okay? So if we think about our lake zone that way, um, then we can start to talk about what are some of the physical properties? What happens in a lake that might affect the water quality or the condition that's in that lake um, right now? So if we take just a typical lake in Minnesota, we cut a cross section through it. This would be just kind of a, a version of that. And what happens is we get um, different conditions uh, vertically throughout the water column. So we call this stratification. And what happens is you get sunlight and warmth hitting the top of the lake or the surface of the lake. That water gets warmer and when it gets warmer, it actually gets lighter. So colder water is denser, warmer water is lighter. And as you start to um, warm that water up and it gets lighter, it gets trapped on the surface and this cold, dense water and the deeper parts of the lake get trapped on the bottom. Okay, and we have terms for these layers. You'll hear me say this, um, epilimnion. This is the area of the lake that you're gonna see. Uh, it's the photic zone, meaning there's lots of light. We can grow algae, plants, fish tend to be there. There tends to be a lot of oxygen because of exchange from um, the atmosphere. Then when the water temperature starts to change dramatically, we call that the metalimnion. And then you have this deep, cold dense water that gets trapped it doesn't mix up into the surface it doesn't have any oxygen um, diffusing across that surface uh, and um, gets uh, goes what we call anoxic and anoxic is devoid of oxygen meaning all the oxygen's gone when you have that you get all these chemical reactions that start to occur in the sediments and different things happen so this is usually at greater than 20 feet any lake or area of the lake that's greater than 20 feet will go into the stratification. Um, zero to 15 feet is that kind of shallower area. Okay. So this is important because it changes how the lake responds to both watershed nutrient inputs, which we'll talk about. It changes how the lake um, operates that goes in there. So now a lot of our lakes in Minnesota are shallow. They're only 15 to 20 feet deep. So what does that mean? Well, it totally changes the characteristic and the management of these lakes. So now what we do is we bring that photic zone all the way up across the whole lake system. And here we expect plants to grow throughout the system. Any sediment processes um, that are going on are gonna interact directly into that photic zone so they can grow algae or plants or whatever that process might be. And so you have this open water area, right? But there's plants growing. Sometimes they reach the surface depending on how shallow your lake is. And then these emergent kind of areas. So because they're shallow and because they're so biologically interactive, 
um, what happens is we get a lot more complex management uh, requirements um, for this part of the lake. So shallow lakes are functionally different. They're very concentrated in that photic zone. There's lots of biological interaction and they also have less volume. So the volume of the lake is important in how well it can assimilate nutrients that come from the watershed or nutrients that may recycle um, within the lake itself. And we'll talk about that a little bit too. So when we think about lake management, we really break it into two sets of lake management. We have deep lake management, which tends to be, we have large open water areas due to that stratification and the deepness um, creating uh, an area where plants can't grow. So that aquatic vegetation is limited to the littoral area that we talked about, the shallower areas of the lake. Um, and then it often responds directly to management actions, meaning that when we do nutrient reduction um, projects in the watershed or in the lake, it responds very quickly to those. Whereas shallow lakes have limited open water area. So uh, I know a lot of residents and um, people that I talk to struggle with all the aquatic plants being at the surface. They can't recreate on the lake the way that they want to inhibits boating. So that's a challenge that we face with shallow lakes, especially if they're used in that way. Um, we often have aquatic plants throughout the lake and uh, we have what we call an indirect response to management actions, meaning we can do a lot of nutrient reduction processes in the watershed, but the lake's not going to respond right away to that. And I'm going to talk about that um, in a second here. So this is really important when you think about what are our expectations for the lake? What do we want the lake to be and how do we want to use the lake? Whether it's a deep or shallow lake um, is important. Now, I wish I could tell you it's one or the other. It's really not. Minnesota's lakes operate on what I would call a continuum, meaning that um, there are deep lakes that have shallow lake characteristics. So they may have a big deep water zone, but also a really large littoral zone that acts like a shallow lake. So here we're trying to manage both those conditions depending on how that is. And we have shallow lakes with deep water characteristics. So they may be mostly shallow and grow vegetation, but then we have an open water area that does stratify like we talked before. So it really gets complicated um, depending on uh, how your lake uh, morphometry is on how the depth and um, direction is all laid out. So I don't want you to think that it's either a deep lake management style or it's a shallow lake management style. It's really this continuum. We have to bring all the tools no matter what type of lake that we're working on. So if we talk about a traditional shallow lake, here's one of the, the challenges we face is, is that a, a shallow lake will exist in one of two states. It either wants to be in a turbid water state where it's dominated by algal growth. There's not a lot of plants because the algae um, use up all the light and shade out any plant growth. And we don't have uh, zooplankton, which are small crustaceans that live in the water column to eat enough of the algae. So the fish prey on them because they can't hide. In a clear water state, we have robust aquatic plants. Now we have a lot of light that goes in the water column and not a lot of algae. And those um, zooplankton grazers can actually hide in those plants and avoid fish fish predation. Um, and so we have this kind of condition. It wants to be in one one state or the other. We either want to be in this turbid water state, which you see on the left with East Goose Lake. This is from the um, Madness Lake Watershed Management Organization, or it's going to want to be in a clear lake state, but then we're going to deal with a lot of plants. A lot of times I get asked, why can't we have the clear lake state, but no plants? And it's just not um, a condition that we can easily manage to. And hopefully I can kind of convince you of that on this slide. So if we look at, we have a clear water state and a turbid water state and a shallow lake. In the clear lake state, um, this is gonna be low nutrients. So it's very poor in nutrients and low turbidity. And so what happens is if we try to push that to an algae dominated state, the ball rolls back. All the energy is holding it into that clear lake state. As we move increased nutrients, we move along this continuum. So there's more nutrients and more turbidity. The lake can be in either state, but the movement, the energy it takes to move between them is less. And as you see, as we get really high nutrients and really high turbidity, all the energy keeps the lake in the turbid water state. So when we do shallow lake management, we're really trying to drive this condition into a place where we can push it from one to the other. So we'll reduce nutrients, reduce turbidity, um, and I'll talk about what some of those projects are, uh, and then get it in a situation where we can push it into the Clear Lake state. Then once we get in the Clear Lake state, we wanna stabilize it as much as we can and manage it to that.
Okay, so my point here is shallow lakes are different. They take a little bit different approach. They tend to be more challenging um, and more frustrating because you don't see immediate reactions. But we do have a lot of tools in the toolbox where we can make a difference in shallow lakes. So let's talk about nutrients. You saw some information about phosphorus. This is just a typical gradient um, of phosphorus and chlorophyll or algal productivity, um, algal growth in the water column. And so on the bottom here, we just have uh, concentrations, typical concentrations of phosphorus. And as you get higher and higher, you expect to go greener and greener. And so if we're in what we call an oligotrophic, you know, we're scientists, we like to have fancy words for all these conditions in a lake. Um, but what you see in a oligotrophic or low phosphorus condition is very clear water. As you increase the phosphorus, you tend to get more algal growth, and so it reduces the clarity. And then you get into these eutrophic and hyper eutrophic conditions, which just means it's very unhealthy at this point. It's um, too much phosphorus in the water column, too much algal growth, and now we're getting into that turbid water state. Or in the case of a deep lake, we can get into what we call severe and nuisance algal blooms. This is when you have the propensity for harmful algal blooms, if you've heard that term, where some species can get selected for they're actually toxic or have the ability to produce toxins. They're not always toxic when they're present. Um, so we really want to avoid those conditions. Okay, so when we think about nutrients, you think about these studies that Tim was talking about, the first thing we're doing is trying to understand where are those nutrients coming from. They can come from the atmosphere. There's actually deposition when it rains. There's what we call wet and dry deposition on lakes where it brings in nutrients into there. You can have it running off from the natural areas of your watershed, and you can have it running off from the uh, unnatural, developed or agricultural or intensively used land that goes in there. Um, all of that washes into the lake. That affects what the concentration is. Um, and then it recycles. So the phosphorus comes in, algae grows, it'll settle to the sediments. Those sediments will start to break down. They'll go anoxic like we talked about with stratification and that phosphorus starts to re-release. We can model all of this. There's simple um, lake models to do this where really your phosphorus concentration in your lake is just what's coming in from the watershed what's being released from the sediments minus what's sedimenting out of that water column. And so we use these tools to understand how many, how much nutrients are coming into the lake, how much can the lake support and still have the clear lake conditions that we want. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on internal loading because this is a really important process in lakes. All that phosphorus that comes into the lake, some of it flushes back out of the lake over time, but some of it reports or settles to the sediments in the bottom. And when it goes down into the sediments, it can either eventually get buried and it gets deep enough that it's permanently immobilized, meaning it's so far from the water column that it no longer, any phosphorus that's in there can't reach the water column. But then we have this interactive layer. And in this interactive layer, um, sediment processes called redox reactions occur, and some of these can result in the re-release of phosphorus into the water column. This is accelerated under anoxic conditions or those conditions without any oxygen in them, and so that stratification can be a really important process. It's important in shallow lakes too because the sediments are so close to the photic zone or that area where you expect a lot of algal growth that any phosphorus that comes out of the sediments at that time can result right in an algal bloom. So we, we spent a lot of time really looking at this internal cycling of um, phosphorus in lakes because it can be a really important source and is often that kind of final step or that mid step that really pushes that lake over into a clearer lake state. And I'll show you that a little bit later. Um, this is that lake stratification. So now we can think about taking that cross section uh, of the lake and looking at where anoxia occurs throughout the lake throughout the different season. So as the lake warms up, it starts to stratify in the deepest um, parts of the lake. So in June, by July and August, and this is Bald Eagle Lake, the project um, we mentioned earlier, uh, almost 75% uh, of the lake by August is anoxic. So all of the sediment in this blue area here is now going through redox reactions that will release phosphorus up into the water column. Um, and that's right in the middle of the growing season when the water temperatures are high. This is when you would expect a lot of algal growth. 
Um, and then as the cooler weather starts to prevail later in August and into September, we start to break that stratification and we start to mix that deeper water up into the surface waters. And that can be a process where we grow a lot of algae. So a lot of times you'll see some of your worst algal blooms as we're, go as, we're as we're transitioning from the summer and into the fall and we're mixing that phosphorus up into that photic zone where the um, algae are just waiting for it to kind of take off. OK, so it's a really important process, especially when lakes go um, when large areas of the lakes go anoxic and we need to know how to manage that um, when we talk about managing the nutrient balance in the lake. And as I've said before, this is really important for a shallow lake system in that your um, any released phosphorus is going right into the photic zone. So on the left here you have um, these little dots would represent phosphorus in the water column and you can see because there's not much volume the concentration gets much higher and it's much easier to recycle it and so you get a lot of algal bloom problems so internal loading can actually be more of a problem in a shallow lake than in a deep lake in a deep lake like we have on the other side a lot of that phosphorus remains trapped down in the um, hypolimnion that cold bottom water trapped uh, in the lake and then it has to diffuse um, up into the water column. So a lot of it stays into uh, that hypolimnion and that actually helps with water quality. So I just wanted to make the point again, shallow lakes are a little more complex, they're a little more sensitive, and they take a different approach. That addresses nutrients. There are other parts of the lake that can have a big impact on water quality and the condition of that. And this is called what we call a trophic cascade. So what is the bio, how does the biological community impact water quality in a lake system? So again, we're kind of using the, the clear and turbid water state, but this also applies to deep lakes. Um, uh, the biology affects water quality in, in a more limited way, but can affect it. So if we think about a clear lake state, we have a lot of plants. Those plants um, stabilize sediments. So we talked about wake boating, how much energy goes into this area. Um, if there's no plants on there, that sediment can get resuspended very easily. With the plants, we dissipate a lot of that energy or those waves, and that sediment doesn't uh, mix up into the water columns. So there's no shading from uh, suspended sediment. Algal growth is low because we're shading it out from the plants, and then we have zooplankton, these crustaceans, uh, live in um, the water column. They can hide in the plants, and so they're very effective at grazing as long as they're not getting eaten by the fish. And then we have what we call balanced fishery, meaning that we have a predominance of top predators that eat those smaller fish, the minnows and um, perch, uh, bluegills, uh, things that would eat the zooplankton. They keep that population in check, essentially. They keep it small, so there's less pressure here. So not only do they have less pressure from there, they can hide um, and do very well. When we get into a turbid lake state or an imbalanced biology in the lake, we kind of have that opposite condition where we don't have enough top predators. We get lots of panfish, so there's heavy pressure on zooplankton um, from grazing from those panfish levels. They also have nowhere to hide because there aren't very many submerged plants, so the fish are very effective at grazing them down, and that allows us to grow a lot of algae. Without the plants, we get a lot of sediment resuspension that shades out the plants and it becomes this kind of feedback mechanism where it holds it into that condition and the algae just thrive there. We're also resuspending, the resuspended sediment can add to the nutrient load in the water column. Um, and that can be really important. So again, thinking about a continuum of lakes in a shallow lake, we know all these interactions occur right up there in the majority of the lake. If you have a lake that has some deep water areas but has a lot of littoral areas, we also have these same interactions that are really important um, in controlling the overall water quality. So um, the more littoral area, the more of these area, um, shallow areas that you have in the lake, the more influence that's going to have on the water quality. Now, I know there's a lot of resistance to plants in lakes, and I get a lot of questions about, can't we just wipe out the plants that's getting in the way of boating or skiing or whatever it is I want to do? But the plants really are kind of a major player in maintaining good water quality in these lake systems. And this is just some ideas of some of the different what we call ecosystem services that uh, vegetation uh, supply to a lake. So we talked about preventing sediment resuspension and we talked about how it provides refugia for zooplankton, but it's also really critical spawning habitat for fish. So if we wanna have a balanced fishery, we really need to have the plants to support the habitat that's in there. 
Um, it provides uh, um, biogeochemical processes. So you see the N2 down in the right hand corner. What's happening here is it's supporting nitrogen um, denitrification is the process and we're gassing off the nitrogen. This maintains a healthy nutrient balance in the sediments. Um, it also provides habitat, food cover, um, nesting material for birds. It's really important for waterfowl, especially those littoral areas or those shallow lakes. So what I really want you to walk away from here is how important aquatic plants are to all lake ecosystems. And the more littoral it is, or the more areas of shallow that you have, the more important that is in the overall process um, that goes in there. Okay, that's that's my primer on shallow lake ecology. So we, we kind of have an understanding of what we're dealing with in terms of all the interactions that go on in a lake how we need to balance all those. Now, how do we start to get into the meat of managing these lakes and pulling together a plan so that we can get the most value, whether it's ecosystem services, recreation, whatever it is we want to get out of those lake systems, how do we get the most out of it? So that really starts with setting good targets and enhancement strategies. How are we going to go about that? So I always want to start with planning. It's really important that um, we have all of the players at the table when we start to think about how to manage these lakes, because it's going to take everybody. It takes local residents that live on the lakes. It takes the residents that live in the watershed. We're very lucky in Minnesota to have watershed districts, municipalities, counties that are very active in lake management. And so they provide a lot of the monitoring services. So the Carver County WMO provides a lot of data for these lakes and a lot of um, opportunity to do restoration activities that in other parts of the country, they just don't have that, that level of commitment to the lake system. So it takes all those groups, it takes state and federal agencies, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and the Clean Water Act um, set a lot of the stage for the activities that we do. But it also takes a sustainable funding source and sustainable practices. How do we get practices in place that will last for the long term, but are also affordable um, and we have a sustainable funding stream for that. Again, in Minnesota, we're quite lucky in the amount of investment that the voters um, and the Clean Water Land and Legacy Act decided that natural resources were very important and we want to have a sustainable funding source and we're able to tap into that. So again, I just really want to say in Minnesota how lucky we are to have so many active players and a sustainable funding source to actually make a difference in a lot of our lakes. Okay, so where do we start? Um, we have to start with understanding our lake systems. What's driving water quality? What's um, stressing the lake out? So this happens with your diagnostic studies and your management plans. This is what Tim was talking about earlier, um, what we try to put together. So we'll do a water quality study. You'll sometimes hear a term total maximum daily load. This is a requirement out of the Clean Water Act that states must implement. Um, and it really just answers the question of how much of a pollutant can go into a water body and still meet those state standards um, that we were talking about earlier. But really good diagnostic studies will also look at that biological structure. They'll ask a question of, do we have a balanced fishery? How might fish be interacting with water um, quality? It really looks at aquatic vegetation or aquatic plants and understanding, is it a, a native or non-native community? Is it um, dominated by aquatic invasive species? Uh, which can change the nature of the lake and how those nutrient processes occur. So all of that's really important part of a good di uh, diagnostic study. And then one of the things that's often not talked about enough for lakes, but can be really important is hydrologic alteration. So many of the lakes that we have in Minnesota are simply because we put an outlet structure on there, backed up water to keep it at a deep enough level, um, and then managed it for that kind of system. So we really need to think about how does that water level control, how does that fluctuation affect not just our properties and our ability to recreate on the lake, whether it's preventing flooding or making sure that, you know, in the case of White Bear Lake, that we're not drying up the lake and our docks have to go farther and farther. But that high, hydrologic interaction can be really important in controlling water quality and in habitat and that vegetation community. So a good diagnostic study will look at all of these factors and start to look at what's stressing the lake and um, what can we do about each of those stressors. So let's start with water quality. This is something that you've um, heard a lot about, you hear about from uh, most of the agencies. It's really where we start with uh, 
uh, managing a good lake system. So there are standards. I have standards in here for the North Central Hardwood Forest and the Western Corn Belt Plate. These plain, these are ecoregions within Minnesota. And these ecoregions have a little bit different characteristics in terms of their underlying geology, um, vegetation, and how they're managed. So there's um, standards set for those two ecoregions. And then there's standards set for deep and shallow lakes. We talked about those functional differences between a deep and shallow lake, and that was recognized when the state put together water quality standards. So really, a great place to start is to um, look at how well are we performing versus um, these standards that suggest once you reach them, you're in a much healthier condition for that lake ecosystem. And that's a pretty simple process. We do uh, summer averages for phosphorus. We can look at chlorophyll. So here we can see phosphorus is very high um, in this lake, and that means there's a lot of chlorophyll. And then our water clarity um, is very low uh, in that process. So this is a great place to start. And we have to understand the nutrient balance, and I call this setting the stage. Now, in deep lakes, a lot of times we can make a lot of progress just through nutrient management alone. Um, and that's just because of that open water area. There's a lot that we can do there. In shallow lakes, we really have to look at a lot of other factors that go in there. The other challenge we have with shallow lakes is we have what I would call a dichotomy of choices. We either are going to be in the algae dominated state or we're going to be in the plant dominated state. So for any algae dominated state, um, it really limits contact recreation. You can have um, nuisance and harmful algal blooms. These are blooms that can um, produce toxins and often we measure toxins higher than what um, the human health uh, standards would be. These result in poor recreational fisheries. Fish struggle in these conditions. Minimal wildlife habitats are so dependent on plants. Um, and then user specific aesthetics. Some people would say, I would rather have a green turbid lake than a lake um, dominated by plants. But you're trading all these other issues where you're losing contact recreation, you're losing that recreational fishery. Um, but it does support boating, um, the one, one use you can use in that kind of condition, but I wouldn't jump out of the boat if I were you. Um, and if we get into a plant dominated state, it does limit that recreational boating or takes more effort to manage that um, and some people would choose that that's a prettier lake or the aesthetics would be user specific, but it supports contact recreation because you don't have those um, human health issues that might be associated with a harmful algal bloom. Um, it, it supports a much better recreational fishery uh, because of the habitat that's in there. It supports wildlife and waterfowl that come through um, in those areas. So when we think about managing for this, I often get asked for, can't you manage the lake to clear water um, with no plants in it. And that condition is just not sustainable in a shallow lake system. Um, if we did get to that condition, you'd be engineering it to a level that you're basically managing an aquarium um, on a very large scale. And that would be very expensive and um, very much not the natural condition of these lakes. So we have to consider these um, outcomes and what we want out of our lake when we're thinking about setting targets for recreation. Okay. So one of the first things we have to do is really work on setting those management objectives. What are the key issues to be addressed? Is it invasive curly leaf pond weed as an infestation? It must be managed first before we can make progress in other areas. Is it watershed sediment loading or nutrient loading? Is it recreational uses? Um, or is it established management goals um, or targets? We can be very specific for what we want to manage those two, saying we want to reduce curly leaf pond weed to less than 10% occurrence. And we think that that'll minimize its negative impacts on the lakes. Okay, or we can say, well, it's a shallow lake. We want to be able to boat on it. We're going to try and maintain a certain acreage of open water through aquatic plant harvesting. Um, or we want to reduce stormwater sediment loading by 50%. This would be come out of your TMDL. What are the reductions needed? So all of these pieces need to come together, but we're thinking about the whole freshwater ecosystem health. We're not just thinking about one component of, I want a boat on it, I want to fish on it, I want um, wildlife habitat. We're trying to look at that overall ecological health and balance all those different conditions. We set the goals. Now we're ready to get to work um, on enhancing our lake and trying to get to a restored lake condition and thinking about practical outcomes. This is not for the faint of heart. We're not going to go out there and in one to two years be able to make dramatic changes in the lake. The lake responds in ways we don't expect um, and we have to adapt to those conditions. We're very good at some things and we're still learning on other things. 
um, and we really need to, to take that into account. So we typically do this in an adaptive management approach, meaning that we design a strategy, we'll have a set timeline for that, say five years, we'll implement it, we'll continue to monitor that system and see how it reacts to our management actions. We'll uh, assess progress towards meeting our goals, and then we may need to design another strategy. We made this much progress here, but we didn't make progress over here. Let's design a new strategy. Um, a lot of times this can take a decade or more to really make major differences in your lake. Um, it kind of depends on where you're at in the process. Most of the lakes that I'm working on, they've been thinking about or working on management activities for at least a decade. And we're at that final, finally at that point where we can make a major difference. Um, all of these things need to account for aquatic invasive species, balanced fishery, um, that biological condition, as well as some of those nutrients. And then in for shallow lake systems, because they are different and they operate differently, there's a, um, a, a very clear kind of approach um, and steps to restore a shallow lake. And that's really identifying and removing those stressors and getting the nutrients under control. You can do all that work and you may not see a major difference in your lake. Noticeably, um, you'll, you'll see it in your data, but you won't necessarily see it when you go out there and look at the lake. And this is what can be frustrating about shallow lakes, but you're setting the stage to get to the shift. Um, and we, sometimes we call this bio manipulation because we're, we're doing things like drawing the whole lake down, wiping out the whole fish community and starting from scratch. It's kind of heavy handed, but it's one of the few approaches we have that has a lot of success that when the lake recovers, it recovers in a much better condition than when it started. And then we really get into, can we establish the aquatic plants and then stabilizing that system in that clear lake state and managing those aquatic vegetation and that system to maximize those beneficial uses. So I don't need to go into too much more detail about that, but there is a strategy. Um, uh, that is established for that, and uh, we've been using that in Minnesota for quite a while now. Okay, let's start with nutrient management. This is where we start. We're setting the stage, or for deep lakes, this is where we can get kind of the biggest bang for the buck. We start in the watershed. We have lots of engineering practices um, or just management practices that can be done. We can use ponds. We can use filtration. Um, sometimes we use iron-enhanced sand. The iron will help strip the phosphorus out of the water when it goes through that sand filter. Um, we can use rain gardens where we're capturing water from our lawns or from some of those areas and we're infiltrating that into groundwater, which is better for the lakes. Or we can um, sweep the streets. There's a lot of agricultural practices that are very similar to this too. We can use buffers, we can use um, wet ponds, contour um, tilling, cover crops. So depending on what type of watershed that you have, there's lots of practices that you can do um, to maintain the nutrients in the watershed and not allow them to load into the lake system. Um, and so that's a pretty, pretty well-known process. We do a lot of these types of practices and they're quite effective. The other part was talking about that internal loading. So that phosphorus that um, resuspends from the sediments goes through those redox processes. One of the processes that we, or one of the treatments we can do to a lake is called an alum treatment. It's where we apply aluminum, uh, liquid aluminum sulfate to the water column. And when it um, hits the water column, it dissociates and forms aluminum hydroxide and then sulfate. And you can see that process here on this lake where you can see the dropper hoses from the barge and you see the stream of that aluminum hydroxide being formed. This settles down into the sediments and then that aluminum hydroxide bonds with phosphate or phosphorus. And so it's kind of a permanent bond. It's very stable in the environment. It won't re-release. It's not sensitive to that anoxic conditions that we talked about. So we've been very effective at restoring lakes by binding up that phosphorus using aluminum sulfate. There are other products you can use out there. You'll hear um, iron filings is being looked at, spent lime because the calcium can form a metal hydroxide too that will bond phosphorus. But really the most tried and true um, tool we have is alum. Uh, and that's why we you'll see that used more often than anything else. There's other products too that are proprietary and they tend to be much more expensive. Um, and we don't have near the history on how effective they are in lake systems. Um, the other thing is we can often do aeration. And aeration can meet a number of goals. You can um, pump air and oxygen deeper into that lake column and prevent that anoxia. 
The problem with this is it takes a lot of energy. Uh, these systems are notoriously finicky. And if one of them fails in the middle of the summer, you can still result in um, a pretty severe or nuisance algae bloom. And so that can be problematic. And so we really, I prefer alum when we can use it because then we're not trying to have this engineering system that needs to operate every year. But sometimes it makes sense when we're trying to protect the fishery, we're doing aeration in these systems. And then we can kind of do two things at once um, and balance those. So it's really a matter of um, designing, understanding what those stressors are and designing a practice that will um, actually be effective uh, at managing the issue at hand. Okay, um, excuse me for a second. Allergy season. Um, so now aquatic invasive species management. Now we're getting into the biological management. We get the nutrients under control. We know how to manage them in the watershed. We know how to manage them in the uh, um, in the lake itself. Now we got to start thinking about how we setting this set the stage for um, managing the biology of the system. Aquatic invasive species are um, non-native species that come in and can kind of change the ecology of the lake. You've probably heard about a lot of them: zebra mussels, curly weed, pond weed, Eurasia water milfoil, brittle naiad. Um, starry stonewort. There's always seems to be a new one showing up. Um, we're lucky in Minnesota to have the Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center. They're constantly looking at both, you know, what are the impacts of the invasion of some of these species, and then how do we manage those? Um, some of them we're very good at managing or getting a lot better at in terms of like curly leaf pondweed or rage water milfoil, but some of the newer ones like starry stonewort, we're still learning what our control options are. And often our control options are limited. When you think about curly leaf pondweed, it's really you can have herbicides that can kill it off the same way that you would kill weeds in a garden or in your lawn, or we can hand pull it or cut it um, using a harvester. Uh, so there's really not like a, some effective tool where we can be very specific and we can kill just the curly leaf pondweed. Um, it just doesn't work that way. Uh, so, um, and then when you get into things like starry stonewort, starry stonewort is actually a macroalgae and uh, it responds to things that like copper, but you don't want to use too much copper because it is a heavy metal in your lake. And so you can use it for a while to control it or you can use it on a spot basis, but we need better tools to figure out how to manage it over the whole lake system. So when we think about managing aquatic invasive species and we think about like zebra mussels, we're still learning a lot about a what their impacts are to the lake, but also learning about how do we control them. Um, zebra mussels are another one where they've had really strong effects on some lakes and not so much in other ones and still trying to learn when they become invasive to a level that they could really uh, wreak havoc on your system and deserve management. Another one you'll hear about is fisheries, managing carp and other rough fish. Carp are ecosystem engineers is a term that we use for them. I mean, that they'll come in, they'll, uh, they're feeding habit, habits, uproot plants, they're digging around in the sediments, so they're resuspending sediments, they're uprooting plants, and so they can wipe out a whole vegetation community. So we spend a lot of time managing carp um, and other rough fish specifically um, to improve water quality in these lakes. And you can see here, this is a kind of a process where you capture some carp, you can actually put insert a radio tag in the carp, um, and then you can track where they go, and then you can do targeted removal uh, of where they are. Uh, in the case where carp infestation is very broad um, throughout the system, sometimes it takes a whole lake drawdown and you can poison the fish and you can wipe them out like you have here. Um, so this is a whole, I could give you a whole talk on carp management and that process and what it takes. It's quite an interesting um, field, but it's really important and you'll see a lot more carp management going on because it does have such a large impact, especially on our very shallow lakes. Okay, so we've kind of, we, we, we looked at the nutrients and the conditions, we've looked at um, the aquatic invasive species. Now we've got those kind of in a good place. Now we really need to think about plants. Plants have a special role in lake systems, especially in Minnesota. And we really need to think about how do we manage our, our plant community um, to maximize those ecosystem services while also um, thinking about some of those recreational or other uses we want to have on a lake. So when I think about managing aquatic vegetation in a lake, I think about three balancing kind of three different aspects. One is what's the best condition for aquatic life? That's going to be 
Um, low algal productivity, lots of plants for spawning habitat that supports macroinvertebrates, that's a food source. And then I think about the other ecosystem services that might be um, provided by those plants. Now we're talking about fish habitat, waterfowl habitat, and a little more, a um, little harder to grasp like biodiversity. What's the importance of biodiversity in these plant communities to make them resilient to invaders like the aquatic invasive species that we talked about. But then we, we have to consider recreation. I mean, we're Minnesotans and we want to recreate on our lake, whether that be boating, fishing, swimming, or what those kind of conditions are. So when we think about aquatic vegetation management in our lake, we have to think about all of these different aspects um, and try to balance them to the best of our ability, which isn't always easy and um, doesn't always make everybody happy. So I always think about aquatic plant management along a continuum. The worst case condition is when we have no vegetation in a lake. In this condition, you are um, dominated by nuisance level algal blooms, and um, they can often be uh, harmful or potentially toxic. People tell me all the time, well, if you get the nutrients low enough, then it'll just be clear and then we won't have the plants. Well, one of two things will happen. Um, I've seen lakes in Iowa go very low in phosphorus um, concentrations, but never reach, still had nuisance algae blooms and harmful algal blooms. So you may not be able to get low enough in any sustainable or affordable way to get there. Or if you get it low enough, the water clears up and the plants just come on their own. So you're going to get them whether you want them or not. Um, and then you can't, uh, you can't get rid of them at that point. Now, I would rather have um, these next two conditions, which is where we're dominated by um, an invasive species, whether it's all curly leaf pondweed, um, or even if it's dominated by a native species, this should be native. I have these backwards, sorry. It really should be here we have all invasive species or here we're all dominated by one like coontail. I don't know if you've lived on a lake, coontail is really popular. Sometimes it grows all the way across the lake. It's the primary species. It um, breaks off and comes to the surface and it can be a real hassle if you want to recreate on that lake. And so we want to think about this continuum of how do we move to really this um, diverse native condition and that's the easiest to manage um, balancing all these different ecosystem functions. If we can get out of these dominated by one species or these really aggressive species and get into this native community, it's much easier to manage um, for those. Now, the first thing you have to do is establish vegetation. So let's start over here where we don't have any vegetation. We get the nutrients controlled. What do we do next? Well, um, the most effective way is drawdown, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But one of the ways we're trying is um, using alum treatments to clear up the water columns. So here you can see we're doing an alum treatment on a lake. When it started, we had these green conditions here. Plants were struggling. Once the alum treatment was done, look how clear the water got. Now we have water penetrating down, and we're allowing that native plant community to expand and grow into some of these other areas. Now we're still learning with this tool. We did an alum treatment on Como Lake, and the plants did not respond. And we wiped out the curly leaf pondweed, and then the native plants didn't respond. And so it doesn't always happen exactly how you want. Um, but these are some of the techniques where we're trying to combine our nutrient control and trying to combine our aquatic plant management to really restore the system. I will give you a success story. This is for the Bald Eagle Lake restoration, where this was actually very effective. This is a deep lake um, that has a lot of shallow lake characteristics, meaning it has a pretty large littoral area. And so this is a 20 year restoration strategy. I started early in my career helping the Rice Creek Watershed District write the total maximum daily load study and writing a restoration plan. They were busy working on projects like curly leaf pondweed, um, uh, installing some sedimentation ponds in the watershed, uh, doing some water reuse and some rain gardens. And so this is just a box plot of phosphorus concentrations. And you can see all that watershed work made some difference um, in the phosphorus concentrations. But after about 20 years or 15 years, I think this is, they got pretty frustrated. Um, and so we were like, well, we think we're ready based on the nutrient balance to do an alum treatment. We did an alum treatment in 2014 where we put down the first half dose and then put the second half dose in 2016. And look at how much the phosphorus concentration dropped. So in 2012, this is the plant area. It's kind of hard to see. Um, there weren't very many plants and they weren't very deep into the into the 
lake water column. In 2014, we saw them start to expand deeper into the water column. And because we've been controlling curly leaf pondweed, a lot of these were native vegetation taxa. So we knocked back the curly leaf and allowed those native taxa to grow deeper. And by 2017, we've seen a significant expansion of those plants. This will increase the stability of this water quality condition in um, Bald Eagle Lake and, and allows us to um, do a lot less work in maintaining curly leaf pondweed because now we have the natives that are in there. The natives are easier to manage. OK, so we're trying this kind of this approach in a lot of these lake systems because this is much more palatable than what I'm going to show you as the next approach. The next approach is often a whole lake drawdown. You're going to lose a whole summer worth of um, recreational use on these lakes uh, and you're going to kill all the fish and turtles and amphibians. It's very heavy handed. Now, in the long run, the ecological condition uh, improvements outweigh that short term take, um, but it is it is. It can be kind of a, a, a tough condition. So what is a whole lake drawdown? It's where you actually physically lower the lake to expose those sediments. Um, it consolidates the sediments. It goes through a lot of um, chemical reactions where we're losing nitrogen through denitrification to the atmosphere. It invigorates the seedbed. I usually liken this to forest fires. You know, we used to fight forest fires forever and ever. And then we learned that that was a natural disturbance process that was important to resetting the forest. It burned out all the undergrowth. It opened up the canopy so that new trees could start to grow um, and invigorated those seeds. The same thing happens with the shallow lake and this whole lake drawdown. Um, so uh, this is a heavier handed approach. It's a little bit harder to um, convince people that we need to do this, especially if it's a highly used recreational lake. So we're trying to find some other methods where we don't have to lose some of those um, recreational uses. And then worst case scenarios, and this was a question we had earlier, um, uh, some of those worst case scenarios, we actually have to try to bring in plants from other lakes and try to transplant those if we don't get plant growth. We are in the very early phases of learning how to do this. These are some pictures from some lakes around the metro where they um, collected plants in a cooler and you do what we call the cooler dump method, which you basically take those fragments of plants, you dump them in the lake and hope that they establish in some nursery areas. A lot of times we're trying to protect them from fish. So you'll see some areas here where we're um, keeping the fish out. We'll plant them in burlap that helps keep them from washing away or wind disturbance or fish disturbance. So we are trying to help them, but we've had limited success with this approach and we're learning as we go. More and more nurseries are starting to provide um, tools for doing this on a larger scale. Um, so this is growing and we're learning how to do this and I'm hopeful that we're going to make some progress over the next five to ten years on learning this process. So the last step is we get the plants, we've kind of stabilized our system, we're feeling pretty good about it, but my gosh, we're still having plants interfere with some of our recreational activities. How much can we actually harvest and what can we do? This is where I like to talk about I call it gardening your lake. It's just like managing your garden in your yard where you want certain plants in certain places. How can we start to manipulate the system to benefit all those ecosystem services while at the same time still managing um, some of those recreational uses? And so here you see this is a typical cross section. What you really want is to support those plants in the floating leaf and the emergent areas. And then you want to have native submerged vegetation that doesn't grow too tall. So there's certain species that you know, Robin's pondweed tends to be lower growing, slower growing. So it protects all the sediments and provides a lot of ecosystem services, but it doesn't um, break into this water column. So you can boat and recreate on top of this while still having some of those beneficial uses. Now, if I told you I knew exactly how to do this, I would have my own company and probably would be very rich because this is very difficult to do um, in this process. But this is with that planting and manipulating these plant communities, this is kind of the, the holy grail that we're trying to achieve is how do we support um, some of those recreational uses by selecting for native plants that will um, help us um, with all the ecosystem services while supporting some of that recreational use. So right now, again, the tools I would also call for aquatic plant management tend to be heavy handed. You know, if we want to manage aquatic vegetation for recreation, we're cutting it using a harvester, we're applying herbicides to kill some of it off, and or we're using rakes or hand pulling or some of those other types of things. This is all um, managed by the Minnesota DNR. Everything, 
all these activities require a permit and it's highly regulated. It's highly regulated because um, plants are so important to the ecosystem. They don't want for one use of recreation for us to go out and clear out all the vegetation and then come back and be like, oh, look, all the water quality is bad. There's no fish. We've lost all those other services. But there, there are there are opportunities to do that. You have um, you can clear vegetation off of your dock. And there is a, uh, a link down here that you can go to to see what you can and can't do. But you can clear vegetation so you have a swimming area. You can cut channels from your property out to open water areas. And I've worked on developing aquatic vegetation management plans where um, this is Red Rock Lake, where we've maintained some open water areas for boating and then channels to provide access. So people that live along the shore over here can get into the channel, get out to the open water area, do the recreation, move between some of these areas and then move back to their homes. So we're providing some recreational benefit while also protecting some of the um, aquatic vegetation. Uh, and here we're very protective of this arm and this arm because these are nurseries. These are the most um, diverse and native communities within the lake, and this is all invasive species in the main part of the lake. So we want to be able to use these nurseries when we control the aquatic invasive species to allow native vegetation to come in. OK, so this is a developing art form. We're learning how to do this. It's not easy. Um, plants have a mind of their own and aquatic invasive species are very difficult to control. But we're getting better every day and we do have some success stories where we have lake associations that are very happy with the outcome of that process. And I quickly want to just say too that not all lakes are equal. <laughs> um, a, a very shallow lake, it doesn't matter what vegetation um, you grow, it's going to break to the surface just because it's very shallow. It really wasn't meant to have that recreational volume on top of it. Um, so if this is only five feet deep, I don't care what native vegetation you have, it's going to grow very close to the surface. And that's going to be much more difficult to maintain um, boating as a recreation or swimming as a recreational use than a deeper shallow lake where you can maintain low growing vegetation um, or you can cut and maintain the vegetation at a certain depth to get that recreational volume on top of it. OK, so not all lakes are, are equal just because, you know, your friend over on the lake, um, you know, a couple miles over is having much better success with their harvesting program or harvesting is allowed doesn't mean that it's going to happen on your lake. It just depends on your conditions. And the last thing I want to talk just a little bit about is shoreline development. Um, there's lots of studies that show that when you overdevelop a shoreline, like the top picture here, when you have a hard seawall, the waves come in, all that energy is reflected back into the lake and it resuspends sediments that creates nutrients. It doesn't allow plants to grow. It doesn't allow for fish or songbird habitat. Um, and then when you have all this uh, green grass, you have a lot of additional runoff because that creates a lot more runoff than native vegetation. If you can naturalize your shoreline, you can still armor it to some extent so you're not getting erosion, but you can have this habitat that goes with it that protects the um, submerged aquatic vegetation. It's hard to see, but you can see them floating in here because it dissipates a lot of the wave energy and allows that vegetation to grow. So. If you want to do something good for your lake, it's naturalizing your shoreline. You're not giving it up. Look, there's still access for boats. They can carry their canoes or whatever they want down to here. We still have a dock accessing out to the lake, but we've maintained a large natural area, which I would say um, adds to the aesthetic value there too. So that's important to think about. Uh, I also just wanted to throw this up there is that the all of the aquatic plant management is highly regulated by the Minnesota DNR. Um, and they're broken into two groups, an aquatic invasive species group and a native plant control group. Usually the native plant control is for recreation. There's very strict rules that are in statutes that they have to follow. Um, so before you would embark on any aquatic vegetation, make sure you reach out to the Minnesota DNR and see what is requiring a permit and what doesn't require a permit. What did we learn? Lake management requires broad support and participation. As you can see, it takes a lot of experts in different fields and it takes your um, watershed management organizations, your counties, municipalities, 
um, and states all being invested in really trying to make a difference in these lake systems. It really it has to be rooted in sound scientific understanding of the lake. Not all lakes are equal. Um, the diversity in the state provides a lot of benefits, but we need to make sure we understand what type of lake are we living on, what are reasonable outcomes for those lakes, um, and what does the diagnostic study show that we can do to make it better. Um, and then finally, it's going to take adaptive management approach. This is you never implement a lot of these activities and just walk away. It takes year to year management. It takes being adaptive to what um, changes might occur that you didn't expect or you couldn't predict. And you're trying to balance all of these um, through those systems at the lowest level. With that, thank you very much for your time and thanks for listening. We can go to questions. Yeah, thanks, Joe, for your, your very <coughs> thorough presentation. Um, so thorough, in fact, that I only have one question so far, <laughs> and that is only uh, can can you share your presentation or a link to it, uh, your slideshow? Madeline, do you want to address that one? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so. We, we we did record the presentation, so we can um, we will send out a link to a recording and kind of a follow up email. Um, and Joe, I don't know if I can send like a PDF of the slides as well, or if they're if the recording is kind of good enough. I'll leave that up to you. Um, but since there are no questions, I actually have a question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering if you could pick in a in all of your experience as an aquatic ecologist. If there were like the top three things that a lakeshore owner could do to protect their lake, what would you, what would you narrow? I'm sure there's a ton, but what would you narrow those top three things down to? Well, I think the most important thing is naturalizing your shoreline. So, you know, it provides a buffer from all that runoff and, and it can soak up a lot of those nutrients. It provides that energy dissipation, supplies a lot, a lot of wildlife habitat. So if there's one thing that you want to do, it's really looking at how much naturalized shoreline can I get into there? I think number two would be controlling the amount of runoff that comes from your lot into the lake directly. Um, and so that means no drain tile directly into the lake. It means controlling rooftop or driveway either um, into a rain garden would be the best case scenario where you can infiltrate that water into the groundwater and it treats a lot of that. Um, I think that's number two and three I would say is um, using um, native landscaping. So I heard I saw a presentation talking about wildlife habitat and supporting these you know the 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 wildlife and waterfowl that use the lake. Um, he described most uh, lots around these lakes as ecological wastelands, meaning that we're using we're using ornamental plants, things that don't provide really any habitat or any um, food base for a lot of the native um, wildlife that's out there. So I think the more you can work towards doing your landscaping with native species that are really designed to support wildlife, I think that'll make a big difference for the overall ecological condition around the lake as well as in the lake. Yeah, thank you. One of my favorite thoughts is, you know, getting native plants in that attract dragonflies and then having those lovely dragonflies eat all the mosquitoes that would otherwise be so bothersome. Yep. Absolutely. Get a little bit of pest management going. <laughs> um, so so those are good points. Um, and just for our attendees here, the, the Carver County Water Management Organization does have a cost share program. So if you are interested in restoring your shoreline or transitioning some of your lawn to uh, more native plants, we have we can provide funding um, based on eligibility and sometimes technical assistance as well to helping you do that. So I will send that out in the follow up email as well. So you guys have those resources. I'll make a quick point too. I did put a link in the presentation to uh, restore your shore. So the DNR has a nice website and um, resource for uh, direction on some of that stuff too. So if people want to look there, that's another place. Perfect. I will capture that and send that out as well. Um, Drew, it looks like we do have a follow-up question. I'm kind of skinny, skimming it real quick. Oh, huh. perfect. I think you may have answered part of it already. <laughs> 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 Trying to read and process at the same time. Um, all right. Well, with that, we are done early unless there are final thoughts from um, any of our colleagues, Drew, Andy, or Tim.
And if not, oh, somebody's got their hand raised. Sorry, I got two screens going on here. Tim, um, go ahead and put your question or comment in the chat and we'll get Drew to read it out loud. I see it. So we do have one question from John. He said, would an alum treatment be beneficial before the lake becomes impaired? Uh, I think that depends. It, you have to do the study, um, meaning you have to go out and collect sediment cores. You have to measure the chemistry in the lake. You can measure the release rate. So we do all this before we would do an alum treatment. That is part of your diagnostic study. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of doing a diagnostic study and understanding the nutrient uh, cycles, even in a lake that's not impaired, because it helps you protect the lake for the long term. So in those conditions, there are times where we've seen lakes that have very low watershed loads, but the internal load is driving that, and an alum treatment might help kind of reset that system and protect it for the long term. But you have to do the diagnostic work up first. You got to collect the sediment cores and, and um, look at that before you would jump to that as a, a tool. Perfect, thank you. Tim from the chat says that we didn't talk much about cattails. I don't know if you have a specific question, Tim, but I don't know where cattails might fit into this, uh, Joe. Uh, cat, I, I avoided them on purpose because they're really hard to manage. <laughs> Um, you know, when we're talking about managing the different zones of vegetation, you know, we focus a lot on the submerged vegetation because that's really what we lose the most. But it is a good point that a lot of the cattails can be very invasive, especially when you have a lot of water level fluctuation, right? And so we talked about hydrology being really important. We can, through water level fluctuation, um, eventually give cattails an advantage. And so I think that can be really important to kind of look at um, those conditions where you have a lot of cattails, what are some of the stressors causing those, and how do you diversify uh, some of those uh, areas? It's very difficult, I can tell you that. I mean, we do a lot of management where we get floating bogs where the cattails break away and we just have to physically remove them. We hire a contractor to come out and just take it out of the lake. Um, so managing that can be very difficult. We don't have great tools for that. That wouldn't be very expensive. And so that tends to limit how many of those projects we do. We do it in wetland restoration a lot more because we can strip all that back. Um, so it's challenging, but there are options. And I think you have to look at the overall system and how it might be affecting that and then prioritize it within that overall analysis. Another question in the chat, um, wondering how um, effects of climate change factors into this. Yeah. I think we're still learning what climate change is doing. I mean, it can increase the extent and duration of anoxia. So I showed you the map of Bald Eagle Lake where the anoxia was and that causes internal loading. We're finding that these longer, drier periods actually expand that. And so we're having longer periods of that um, anoxia and it's a larger area of the lake and that affects the nutrient balance. So we have to take that into account when we're thinking about management. The higher temperatures can lead to a propensity for harmful algal blooms. So you get more blue green algae that might be toxin producers. So as we have longer, drier, hotter summers, we're going to have to really look at um, what the species composition is. This is something we miss. We, we always measure it by chlorophyll. So it gives an idea of all the algae, but we don't know what type is in there. And that can be really important. So I think it's going to have to change our monitoring approach. And this is a hot topic where I think more and more groups are going to look at algal communities so that they can understand what are the impacts on some of those. Uh, the other thing is drainage. So we're talking about more frequent high intensity storms, right? So or less frequent, but more intense storms. Those are causing more erosion. They're bringing in more nutrients. It's going to change how we manage drainage patterns in the watershed. So we're always looking at it. It's changing how we do things, and it's something that we need to account for. I really like this last question. What should I tell my neighbor who complains about <laughs> the plants in the lake? Well, hopefully you learned tonight that how important plants are to maintaining good water quality in the lake and maintaining a good fishery, maintaining all those areas. And so I think you just have to say that, look, we understand the problems of plants caused with some of the recreational uses, but they provide such an important service to the overall lake health system. We need to learn how to balance that with the recreational uses that we want from our lake. 
I did have another one pop in here. Um, does the DNR have a formula for vegetation removal permits? Uh, in the past, many residents contracted for vegetation removal on Bavaria. Yep, there's a, there is specific rules about what you can and can't do. If you contract with some of the local um, applicators or lake restoration companies, uh, they know what a lot of those rules are. So you have to apply for a permit. So I can't remember exactly what it is. I think you can get like a 50 by 50 area cleared off your dock for swimming. You can hire a contractor to come in and use herbicide to do that. You're allowed to treat for things like swimmer's itch. So there are some specific designations of those that we just didn't have time to get into all the specifics of those. But if you work with the local DNR, they they will let you know what you can and can't do. And then typically the, the counties or watersheds will look at all of that in light of the overall management of the vegetation to make sure we're not damaging the overall system. So this is where doing routine aquatic plant surveys, making sure we're not losing diversity, we're not losing flourish to quality um, when we're doing all those actions. If we see those declines, then we have to ask the question, is what we're doing sustainable? So we would work together with the DNR to, to figure that out. Okay, I think that's all I have currently for questions. I'm going to see if I can throw a link in the chat about the uh, aquatic um, vegetation permits and DNR stuff. It's in the presentation too. That's right. Thanks, Drew. We'll nab all those links off the presentations and send them out. So tomorrow we will follow up with um, everyone who attended with just a quick email, provide you some links, get you a link to the recording, um, and then if you guys have questions or, you know, water um, or seeking knowledge about water resources or native plants or um, even the DNR permits, uh, please reach out to any of us. You'll have our contact information. So we're happy to help you navigate lake management and lake health. And with that, I will say thank you for attending and have a wonderful night. It's still light outside, so you can get outside and enjoy some of this lovely kind of finely warm weather we're having. Great. Thanks, thanks everyone. everyone. And thanks, Joe. Absolutely, thank you.